now. We're going to be all coming and talking from a diverse background within the PR industry. So this is going to be a great time for you guys to get some tips, some advice, and answer a lot of questions and kind of give you guys a, some motivation to kind of get started in going into the PR field. So this is going to we our first panelist is Rosemary Perilla and she is an adjunct professor at Kane. She is also former editor in chief in chief of the Inside New Jersey magazine. Um, uh, all of our professors are adjunct professors except Professor Adkins. Professor Adkins is a full time professor at Kane and she's the Ocean County coordinator. Um, she also is involved in the Kane Communications Club. Um, we have Professor Panero. Hi, is that how I say it? Perfect. And she's um, an adjunct professor at Kane as well. Oops. And she's also um, involved in the Somerville Alliance. And we have um, Professor McNamara is not here yet, but we have Dr. Kohler. And she has her own company, Christian and Kohler and Associates. And she's, an all, she's the owner of her own company and she's also an adjunct professor at Kane. And then we have Professor Cecilia. I'm sorry, how do I pronounce your name? I just wanna get it right. Via Chikala. Chikala. Okay, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> um, and Professor Chikala is an adjunct professor and she's also the president and executive producer of AVC Productions. So Jada is gonna be our moderator today. She's gonna to be asking all of the questions. We highlighted the most important questions that we're, we thought were gonna be the most beneficial for today's session. And then if we have a lot, we're gonna give them about the most necessary time to answer each question, um, as well as we're gonna see if we have more time to go back and answer more questions and as well as open up the panel for any extra questions if you guys have any other ones. But we made them pretty generic, we made some pretty generic questions and then we also asked some more advanced questions about their experience in the field so you guys get a little bit more personal. So if you guys have other questions, um, feel free to just let us know in the chat um, so we can dedicate 10 minutes at the end of the session. But I'm gonna give it away to Jada to get started and start um, asking the questions. Hey, hello everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us today. So we want to start off with the question, and this is open to the entire panel, of course. Um, what steered you into the field of public relations? Anyone like to jump in with like a quick story or a tidbit or? <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, I don't mind. I think if any of my students are on, they've probably heard my story ad nauseum. But, you know, I, um, I started out at Kane um, as a theater major and uh, deciding I didn't want to be poor, I decided I should probably regroup uh, and think of, of another, you know, of, of another major. And so, like many people, I um, that eventually ended up in PR, especially at the same, around the same time I did, I was a major in actually print journalism. And so I was more than halfway through, uh, actually I was three quarters of the way through done with my degree program. And I, you know, witnessed the print market just completely tank. And along with that sinking ship went my dreams of seeing my name, you know, in the byline of my favorite local newspaper. Um, and so I had to regroup pretty quickly. And at the time, uh, my advisor was Dr. Freda Remmers and we, um, you know, we, we kind of regrouped and she said, I think you're really talented and I think you should probably look into some classes, some PR classes. And I said, all right, why not? So I, I started taking a lot of PR classes and I realized it combined all of the things that I really loved about uh, journalism, about theater, right? Um, and so I, I pursued that. I did some internships um, and, uh, you know, slowly but surely, I really fell in love with the field and I eventually ended up in government and politics and more recently I transitioned over into nonprofit. Um, I also own a boutique firm called In Creative Strategies. So we're, you know, it's, it's, it's been a, a long road, but uh, I'm certainly glad that I ended up here. Okay, thank you very much. Would anyone else like to share their story of how they got started in PR? 
I guess I'll just echo that statement that Natalie made. Um, I myself went to Monmouth and I was a journalism major and um, I found myself always obtaining public relations internships and journalism was kind of switching focus and I found myself um, being able to utilize those writing skills, organizational skills in a more public relations capacity. So a lot of my earlier jobs in my career were in public relations. And Thank you. Would anyone else like to share their story? I can jump in. I um, also wasn't quite sure where I wanted to end up. I wanted to work in sports and marketing was in the business school, which had a lot of prerequisites with scary names like economics and that kind of stuff that I wasn't interested in. Um, and I was in school probably before a lot of people on this call and PR had just started to come into its own as a, in my case, a minor um, that was later formalized into a degree. So I was actually one of the first graduating classes that actually was called PR um, at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. So, so I went the end route into communications around uh, marketing in the business school. But like any, everybody else has said, it definitely tied in what I was looking for with outreach and communication strategy, media relations as well. I think you see from what other people have been saying that a lot of times you wind up in a career that you may not have started out thinking you were going to be in. I was going to be a secondary education English teacher and I wound up in journalism. So I'm a little bit different than everybody else here because I have spent my entire career as a, um, as a journalist. And so I'm on the other side of the aisle where I've worked with many public relations people over the years in various venues. Um, you'll find out that sometimes where you wind up isn't where exactly you started. So you should always leave your windows open and be prepared to go wherever things lead you. you Jada, do you mind if I just jump in on for a second on that question? Go ahead. Um, Professor Perillo or even uh, Professor uh, Chicago as well. I know you're coming at the subject a little bit differently than some of our other panelists. Um, maybe to kind of piggyback off of Jada's question too is, um, I guess in your, in your career paths, when did you first started working with PR professionals and what, what was kind of that dynamic like? I, I could, that's okay. I don't want to interrupt. Uh, I'm sorry, you mentioned someone else. Is that okay? Please. Okay. So yeah, so uh, my background is, is, is in TV news. So I worked at NBC, ABC, and CBS. And I will tell you that as a producer, public relations plays and continue to plays a really crucial role in determining what stories potentially get covered. So uh, I was pitched constantly when I was at the networks from a variety of different public relations agencies who of course they are seeking coverage for their clients. So uh, looking at, and, and it was working in a newsroom is, is a very intense experience. So you've got, there's so much information overload coming at you at one time. Uh, so, I remember distinctly that, you know, sifting through at the time, whether it was coming over via fax, that we would get new, you know, media alerts and that sort of thing. The key thing, and I, I always impress, you know, impress upon this with my students, being able to say what you mean, have a really solid hook. If you've got those two things, a hook and really be able to articulate what you've got up here on paper, digitally, however, is a critical skill. Not even just for the PR, but I think in general and in, in life and in, in the work environment. So that's something that I learned you know, early on in my career, the importance of public re relations and working with PR representatives potentially to cover certain stories. So that's kind of the lens in which that I look, you know, look at public relations from that perspective. Okay, and actually, if anyone else wanted to jump in, I can actually lead that into one of our other questions that we had set up for the panel. Um, so we have a lot of people that come from like varying different backgrounds that either ended up in PR and didn't expect to or ended up in it accidentally. So considering that we're all sort of like connected by this one industry, 
what do you consider to be like the most important like personality traits or characteristics that would make someone successful in working in PR? I will just say that one skill I find valuable is to be able to recognize that it's not about you personally and it's sometimes about your client or the organization you're representing or the product and I think you have to have a lot of humility to be able to put yourself in the background like it's different than journalism you don't always get a byline you don't always get credit for the wonderful hits that you obtain and to be okay with that and just be like, cool, I just got coverage for my client, but nobody knows you're on the back of that. Um, I, want, I, I just want to jump in for a second. I think I, I agree 100%, um, you know, with Courtney. I think that, you know, one of the things that I tell my students is that, um, you know, networking is a huge part you know, your personal network, your professional network is a huge part of what we do. And, you know, not to go, not to, not to bring it back to class, but when we talk about, you know, PR at its very, uh, at its most basic, we talk about building those mutually beneficial relationships. And so I tell everybody that it really starts with their personal network um, and really having the ability to connect with people on a very genuine level and build those relationships, whether it be with a client, uh, whether it be with the media, um, you know, be it with your constituents that you're trying to reach out to, um, it's about authenticity. So I think, you know, figuring out how to be your most authentic self while building relationships and nurturing those relationships, because it's not something that you just establish and then leave it be, right? We're constantly, you know, shaking that network tree. Um, so I think that starting very early on to, to learn how to network and network effectively and realizing that network is so much more than just walking into a room and having a conversation with somebody, right? Figuring out what it is that builds those relationships is really gonna be helpful, you know, moving forward and, and you know, kind of uh, establishing yourself in the field. I think maintaining professionalism is also very important. Um, uh, from the journalism side, dealing with a PR person who's very professional and understands what it, understands my mission and I should understand your mission. A lot of times it's perceived that there's an adversarial relationship between uh, journalists and PR professionals. It can become adversarial, but when it does, I think that's been a failure of communication and of both parties not really understanding what each person's mission is. I need to understand your limitations of what you may be permitted to do, and you need to understand my lim what my goal is in uh, you know uh, whatever project we're working on together, and that um, you know I don't want to feel like I'm being controlled. So your mission is you have a message and a brand that you need to present, but I also have um, an obligation to get the story. So. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, those two things can clash. So, but professionalism and understanding where, where we're both coming from is, is, you know, really, really important. And it helps, you know, when you have, a, when you build a good relationship with a PR professional, it's great. You know, it can really work for both of you. I can actually add to what um, Rosemary was saying about, the, to, to expand upon that. So, just as an example about managing expectations and what you're selling, let's say, so to speak, to a potential media outlet as the goods. So when I was at NBC, I was uh, the health producer for, for a considerable amount of time. And I would get pitched very often from PR agencies as well as hospitals. So of course, every major hospital, they have their own communications department, their own PR division. And oftentimes they would call and pitch one of their doctors for, you know, whether there's a new medical procedure that came out that they're doing and that kind of thing. And unfortunately, there were times where we had to take a pass on their physician because they didn't have a patient that could speak to whatever it was that they were. So let's say it was a doctor who had, you know, a new orthopedic procedure and he was the person or she was the person who, you know, created this new device or what have you in order to bring that story to life 
we needed a patient. So sometimes in terms of what's expected, right, for both parties to have this win-win situation where, okay, we'll be able to give your doctor coverage on our media outlet, but we also need you to understand that from a storytelling perspective, we also need a patient who can tell us about how this particular physician or how this new procedure improve their life and that sort of thing. So it really is definitely uh, so crucial that the PR person understands what is going to make a good story, whether you're doing a print story or a story that will ultimately be broadcast. A really, really great responses. So does anybody else want to chime in or we can lead into our um, next question that we had that's kind of connected to um, everything that everyone just explained, if anyone else wanted to add to that. Okay, so moving ahead off of that, um, one question that we did have that's kind of connected to like sort of working with people and building those relationships, how often do you take ethics into consideration when working in the field of PR? Can you repeat that? So the question was, how often do you take ethics into consideration when working in the field of PR? Well, well I, would, I would hope that, I would hope that every public relations professional is taking ethics into account <laughs> when they are representing uh, any client. Um, uh, because the writer from the other side is bound by tons of ethics guidelines uh, for the newspaper and community guidelines. So we, we have to adhere to uh, a number of ethics um, uh, rules and regulations. So we are, you know, in a way hoping that the people that we're dealing with on the PR side are also um, adhering to, to ethical standards from their, in, in their profession, you know. I feel from like my own personal experience, I remember working for a company in New York um, earlier in my 20s and it was a really cool like starting off experience. It was called HWHPR and one of my clients was Helen of Troy and I was basically working, you know, for various clients, but I was just like writing a lot of press releases for hair straighteners and, you know, hair devices, but also soon. And it was an enjoyable experience, but I remember, you know, wanting to leave that experience at some point and talking to my manager about it and saying, you know, like, I really don't care about hair straighteners. I don't care about this product. Like, it's great that Glamour Magazine has given us a hit, but for me to spend my time, you know, writing press releases for a product that I don't personally care for, I, that was my ethical challenge. And it made me, you know, kind of steer into public relations for nonprofit more so I could maybe spend my energy helping causes that I am on board with. Not that there's anything wrong with hair straighteners. <laughs> um, I just, to chime in, I think that, you know, uh, having, I, m my experience kind of runs the gamut, right? So when I first came out of college, I worked in the fashion industry and I, um, I worked for a boutique accessories firm. And then after that, I transitioned and I started working in government and politics. And so, you know, when, when I started out, um, I was just so excited to be working in the fashion industry um, that I kind of, the, the whole ethics part wasn't really on the, in the forefront of my brain. Um, after having worked with journalists for a long time and even, you know, kind of had some of my educational backgrounds being in journalism, I came to realize that there was a lot of gifting that was going on in the fashion industry. Um, and, you know, it wasn't until later on that I realized, hey, this might not be the most ethical of practices, right? Um, because obviously there was an expectation that, that the, you know, that the agency was going to get something in return. Um, so, you know, 
after working there for a while, um, you know, I, I moved on just because it was my personal preference. But clearly, you know, there are, there are some ethical challenges that, that not a lot of us, because we live in the age of, you know, Instagram and influencers and, you know, part of the natural kind of progression of getting your brand noticed, um, you know, has to do with gifting, right? And, and kind of sending samples out. Um, I think that, that kind of part of the ethics is kind of um, missing for people. Um, and then also just working in government and politics, um, you know, as, as much as, you know, you um, are personally, I, I try to be as ethical as possible. There were definitely instances um, where I came you know, into some situations that were um, ethically questionable. And so at that point, I had to rely on, you know, my own, you know, moral and ethical, um, you know, kind of uh, inner compass to decide whether or not it was something that I wanted to, to, to continue to pursue. And ultimately, I, I moved on. But, you know, ethics, um, if you're not operating with it in the forefront of your mind, it's something that you can easily kind of be maneuvered or steered into, um, you know, potentially doing something that's questionable, so. I'd like to piggyback off of what Natalie said about gifting. Uh, I spent like five or six years as features editor at the Star-Ledger, among many other jobs, but um, so in the features department, uh, that's the one department where tons and tons of product is just sent to you. Obviously, we are not asking for product, but we got tons of product, you know, uh, we're doing home, we're doing TV, we're doing, uh, you know, all the various entertainment sections. So uh, obviously we're not allowed to accept it per se. So what we would do is we would just take all the swag and put it in a room. And then at the end of the year, we would have a holiday auction and collect money and then donate that to a charity in the city. So there are some ways to get around it. But in general, I don't think people really understand, especially when you're dealing with business, that uh, gifting is not acceptable uh, for most uh, media outlets. We, we can't take anything. We could be fired for taking money, obviously, uh, but any kind of product or any kind of free tickets or, or free anything. So. Yeah, I think it's interesting you both bring that up. Even on the um, the PRSSA website, when I teach our intro class, there's a whole section on, on ethics. And even on the PRSA website, uh, Dr. Kohler, I don't know if you've seen this before, but there's even an ethics portion that you can kind of reach out to anonymously and say, I'm, kind of, I'm dealing with with this situation. Can you, can you help? Um, and I guess that was certainly the first indicator as an instructor that you know, it, more often than not, particularly as the lines start to blur, people are struggling, even, you know, working professionals with, with how far to, to kind of push that limit, so to speak. I do think a lot of places do take the gifts, though. I remember, like, setting up a media day um, for the product that I was working on. It was actually an ovulation tester. And at the time, I, I don't even think I really understood ovulation. I was like very young and I'm like, what the hell is this thing? But we had the clients come in and like, we had lunch for them. We had grab bags, goodie bags. And it was a really nice event that the editors got to go home with a gift bag. And then, you know, as the weeks go, went by, you know, you would see us get the hit in Newsweek or get a little mention on somebody's gift list for an idea. And it was cool. But again, like from the PR side of the person giving the gift, you know, I kind of wanted to be on the side where I got the gift. <laughs> and that's not very ethical. Um, when I was interning at Howard Stern, they had a box in their intern room. And the box was just like a mecca of all of the free stuff that people send Howard Stern because they want him to talk about their book or their CD or their underwear, you know, like a lot of weird, weird stuff. And one of my jobs as an intern would just be to like go through this box and, you know, check out the book or check out the products. And if anything spoke to me, then I would put it to the side and then like sign it send it up to the producer. So I don't know, like gifts are there. I, I do think a lot of people accept the gifts. I haven't been in the corporate PR world in a while, so I don't necessarily know 
you know, exactly how it is now per se, but back like when I was in, in the game more, gifts were a thing. And I mean, my sister's a musician and the stuff that she gets sent for free is, is insane. Like guitars, clothes, um, shoes. I'm just like, whoa, you know, where, where's my box? <laughs> I never get anything for free. <laughs> So aside from actual like gift giving and things like that, what does like, and this is for the entire panel, what would you consider to be like good tricks or strategies that will boost the chance of getting a story featured? I think knowing, uh, knowing where to pitch your story, uh, not wasting your time pitching your story to outlets that you should know would probably have no interest in this. I think a PR professional needs to know um, all the various media outlets that are available to them and know what it is they do and what kind of stories they are more than likely to feature. Otherwise, they're kind of just wasting their energy, uh, just blindly pitching people without, you know, you really have no chance getting this, um, you know, uh, getting it. Uh, getting a hit on it. So I think for your own sake, uh, you should really know the media landscape and who is doing what and specifically which person you need to get to to get this thing in front of them. Uh, so you kind of like need to do your homework and know and know, uh, you know, it'll kind of map out your territory where to send things. Uh, Rosemary, just to just to piggyback off that, I think that that just goes to articulate how important it is to know your audience, right? Uh, we talk about, you know, segmenting your audience and knowing your audience and knowing where they get their information, right? And that's that's why it's so important. Um, so knowing your audience really well, knowing where they get their info, and then following that up with, you know, high quality materials. You know, I think that we're living in a visual age where, you know, visuals, high quality visuals are a must in terms of, you know, photos and even videos um, when you're pitching your, your material. Um, you know, so I think that, you know, knowing all of those things, I think those are kind of, you know, your, your kind of your go-to, right, to get things uh, featured. Right. Piggybacking off a few things people have mentioned, like just about like knowing your hook, knowing who you're pitching. I find that when you're sending things to journalists and editors, I mean, just kind of researching what work they do, what they've written, what their, their um, you know, latest headline was. So it's, it's good to have some understanding of who you're sending that email to. And that could really even apply for a job interview or even just like if you were to go on a first date with somebody you met online, like you kind of research them a little bit. So having some awareness of who you're marketing your, your stuff to. You know, and making sure that your pitch is professional, right? That uh, if, if it's a press release, if it's riddled with uh, grammatical errors and spelling mistakes and uh, things like that, it's you're probably, no one's going to take it seriously. So you really need to, you, you, need, you need to be a, a decent writer in order to attract a writer to your story. Uh, and I just want to jump in. I mean, you know, I think we have a, a fabulous group of folks um, on this, this Zoom today. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the other thing that we need to really focus on too is, you know, the difference in presentation between, you know, when you're pitching, you know, a, a media outlet like the Star Ledger and when you're going after an influencer, right? So I think that, you know, understanding, you know, I think it's really, really important to understand that there is a difference, right? It's not, you don't just put together a package you know, that has all of this stuff in it and then just send it out into the world, right? So, you know, you really have to understand what the needs are, right? So for example, you know, if, if, you're, if you're dealing with somebody who, you know, you want to uh, maybe give you a feature on Instagram, right? Understanding that your visuals and, and how you kind of send out your photos and your video have to be formatted a certain way. And that's gonna be different from how you format it when you send it out to, you know, the Star Ledger or, you know, any other digital magazine. So I think that's important too, is understanding that there's not, like a one size fits all approach mm -hmm. to getting a feature, right? And that's why it's so important 
you know, to know your media outlets as much as you know your audience as well. I mean, I think in, in my class, I've even told my class to include the media as part of your audience when you're segmenting your different audiences, right? Because you need to know them just as well. I would agree, Natalie, same here. And so moving forward to kind of get some insight into what working in the PR field like is like on a day to day. Um, so like how would you sort of prioritize and like start your work day, like an average work day? Lots of coffee. <laughs> now, would you start with like the breakfast blend and work your way up to <laughs> bold? Start with the bold and work your way down to the breakfast blend? Is it 10 and 2? What's, what's the, these kids need to know, what's the, these students, I'm sorry, should need to know, what's, what's the right formula? I think you start off with, with like a nice, like regular, like uh, dark roast coffee, okay. right? And you kind of work your way up. I think at three o'clock calls for an espresso to kind of get you over okay. to the hump. You know, <laughs> I'm glad I'm, I've been doing it all wrong. I'm, I'm very thankful I'm on this call. I appreciate the, the insight. Thank you, Natalie. I'm, I'm loving the coffee. Um, I remember when I was working in St. Louis at Fleischman Hillard, one of my first morning activities with my coffee was to target every client that I was on the account for. So I was on for like Kodak, Abbott Pharmaceuticals, and I had specific search words. So I would want to see where they fell in each news publication every day. So if Kodak was to get a hit, um, then I would write a little paragraph and clip it. Or, you know, anytime Abbott Pharmaceuticals mentioned Tanzania and AIDS, I would have to clip it. So I would spend the majority of my morning researching and, you know, trying to see where that um, product or Play, play, person falls into the news and I, I forget what the saying is but it's something about like you're only as good as yesterday's news or something like sometimes overnight um the world changes yeah and things just turn in a, at a dime so having the ability to research and commit yourself to that and even what the competition is doing would be a good skill in the morning and coffee to kind of tie into, oops, sorry. Um, to kind of tie into one of the characteristics you talked about, I say I have to start every day with flexibility because it's not going to be the way in which I envisioned it going to bed the night before. Um, you know, I'm a big note writer on my my phone. I still like some longhand sticky note reminders and kind of have to do lists all over the place. Um, I'm in a little bit of a different position now. Um, you know, I've worked with NBA teams, like high level college coaches when I worked with CBS Sports. And now I, I work with million dollar donors at colleges and universities who all to get back into the gifting conversation or want to have stories to tell and that kind of a thing. Um, and now I work with primarily high impact local nonprofits. And especially today, <laughs> um, Giving Tuesday, December 1st, but also today in the new COVID world, whoever needs that attention needs it right now because it's government funding, it's local funding, it's individual donors, it's food drives, it's toy drives, it's all happening literally today on Giving Tuesday, December 1st, um, but at this time as well. So again, as soon as these opportunities kind of arise, you have to be flexible enough to be able to take advantage. And, and unfortunately, a lot of this happens, as everybody's kind of saying, overnight. And I would say, you know, back to that point of waking up with the, the I have a list kind of tiered that these are the things I have to do today before midnight. These are the things that I wanna do today. And then if this ever happens again, where all the planets align, these are the things I could do if I had an extra 20 minutes, half hour, two hours tonight. So just to kind of, um, you know, for my own well-being, I can see progress as at least I start to cross things off. But you do feel that sense of accomplishment by the end of the day, uh, having kind of been flexible in moving through your priority list. Dr. Kohler, just a quick question to you. I know you've, you've touched a lot of different industries in your career. Is there any, anything that's been a constant or anything that ties them all together? Flexibility. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, working with um, NBA teams, they all wanted to be the first ones on the marketing side with sponsorships and fulfillments. Um, you know, launching the WNBA was life-changing for a, a college or 
a women's basketball, you know, proponent and supporter, um, you know, everything was so complicated and time sensitive. Same thing, again, even down to these really small nonprofits that I, I found my niche with at the moment. Um, the one big thing is you kind of have to explain PR to them <laughs> when it's not the business, when they're not agency, you know, owners and operators. And that's where, you know, I don't know my earlyhood, early childhood education licensing standards, but I know what I can do to make their operations easier and bring in funding so they can fulfill their mission. And that's kind of, I would say, the, the constant across the board. Um, you know, working for CBS, sports on the NCAA accounts, I got to see a lot of that prioritization and, and we, we talk about gifting and who leaves tickets for whose kid at what game maybe would have the more prominent market, uh, you know, who has what recruit and what market. A lot of it is just listening and listening with intent, trying to figure out what people are saying when they're saying things and, you know, making sure that um, you manage up in those positions as well. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a very big, broad field, but a lot of those tenants that, that even we've talked about today, those ethical boundaries are clear. Those mutually beneficial relationships are clear. <laughs> um, and that that is a two-sided equation as well. And obviously the role of the media is, is so integral and important um, and that the roles are, are crystal clear as well. So moving into working with clients, um, in the event that you have like a client that may have unrealistic expectations for what they want or what they need, how do you deal with like those kinds of situations? I deal a lot with money, <laughs> bringing in money from outside organizations. So if they're looking to raise X amount, I ask them to show me their budget, which is like, here and their expectations are here and I will you know like write out the difference on a piece of paper to physically show them um, it's a hard conversation to have and you know I think it also ties into the ethics and that kind of a thing as well I've unfortunately had to walk away from clients that I have engaged with I have also not accepted engagements you know just even based on some of the initial information um, you know before I'll sign an agreement or a contract or something so it's I think as long as, as you present yourself and your position strongly, um, because there are people, and, and trust me, when I went out on my own as an independent practitioner, it was hard to say no to a client. It was really hard, um, but I had to because that's how I built my credibility. And you know that was not an easy conversation to have when you kind of see the checks in front of your face, um, but the more that you can invest in yourself and, and that, the importance of confidence in public relations cannot be overstated. If you're not going to be confident in what you do and what you propose, and obviously having done your research and strategy and planning and all that, um, you, you won't be successful because you're, you're being brought in for a specific reason and your expertise and your confidence and knowledge. Um, so that sometimes it's hard to set those expectations, uh, but having that confidence in yourself and in your experience and expertise has to be done. I also think that part of it is also learning uh, how, to, how to frame things in a certain way, right? So I think that, you know, you, you have to manage your client as much as you have to manage, you know, uh, manage others. And so I think that part of it really is sometimes, you know, getting your client to understand that maybe what they want isn't, ex or, or what they're articulating isn't exactly what they want, right? Or maybe the way that they want to go about achieving their objectives or achieving, or achieving their goals, right, could be achieved in a different way. And so I always find it really helpful, um, you know, to approach any situation from a very data-driven perspective, because, you know, as we know, there are still a lot of people that don't really understand the value of public relations, but they see the value of data, 
right? Um, and so I think that, you know, approaching any situation from, from a data-driven perspective is really important. You know, doing your homework beforehand when you're dealing with a client um, or even your employer, right? If you're in-house public relations and your boss really has an unrealistic expectation for something, you know, aside from having a come to Jesus moment, I always come to, to the table, you know, with a couple of different options that might get us close to where we want to be, right? Because we can't always achieve 100%, but we might be able to get close, you know? So. It's to, to Natalie's point, 100% managing expectations. And that is just, Jada, you know, your question, really having a meeting of the minds, because if your client, and, and honestly, whether I think this kind of can across all verticals, all different industries, if a client has an idea of how they want, number one, you know, what is the idea, how they want, what's the strategy, the execution, it may not truly be a viable option to pursue the way they want to go down the path. And it's, it's so crucial, like Natalie was saying, and Kristen, to really hone in when you are having those initial discussions so that you kind of, you know, the game, you know, the rules of the game need to be, <laughs> you know, first meeting, uh, you know, after the brainstorm and understanding what it is the client is looking for, but to really manage that expect, those expectations. And, and an, another thing I think, which is so crucial for the PR industry professionals or the future PR professionals, having a thick skin and being resilient because you will get no's. You will, there were times that I, I did, you know, we couldn't cover a specific story. Uh, but that, and I would always say, you know, but look, hit me up again if there's something that, that maybe we can do together. So don't take a no as a never. So always remember that. So no doesn't mean never. It may just be, it's just not the right time or the right story or the right client. But it definitely, it, grow a thick skin, <laughs> be resilient. And while you need to be persistent, it also takes some patience because you also don't want to be perceived by media outlets, you know, and, and other types of, whether you're print or broadcast or even on social that you're hounding. You know, there's that, it's a fine line, but through time and through practice, it's that, that, that delicate balance of, yes, you need to be persistent, be tenacious, but you do need some patience. People, and especially today where people are, there's so much content consumption on so many different levels and people are getting their information from online, television, their devices, their phones. It's, it's really overwhelming. So just hang in there and remember, no doesn't mean never. Thank you very much. Um, so kind of going off of that, um, in, in the event of maybe like working with um, a client and for lack of a better term, working with just bad clients that just don't really give you much to work with or much to move forward with. Um, I don't wanna just ask how those experiences are like, but how often do you come across clients that are just undesirable for lack of a better term? Should I move on to another will, question? <laughs> I'll just say one thing. Like, I don't do PR much anymore, but the past few years when I do do public relations, it's for free. So I'm usually running an event and trying to gravitate, you know, a lot of love for a nonprofit. Like, I, I do nonprofit work for the Shark River Cleanup Coalition, which is you know, a grassroots 501c3 organization for the river in my hometown. Um, the people that run this organization, they're like a bunch of hippies and they are very difficult to work for. Um, the one thing that gets me moving for them is the fact that I love the river. So like I'm willing to deal with these hippies for free. I, I think that you know, what, someone, what did, who was just talking? Angel, it was, no, it was Natalie. You were talking about having a thick skin or, or was it Angelina? Somebody was. I feel like, 
you know, that's an area that I struggled with, with public relations. And I struggled with that whole thick skin thing. And that's one of the reasons I kind of moved towards doing PR for nonprofits in a volunteer capacity. Because for me, it's not my main bread and butter for a job. But, you know, I, I think to be a public relations professional in certain industries, you really need to be able to like not personalize things and not go home in tears. And not everybody can do that. And sometimes it, it just happens over time, right? I remember when I started, the fashion industry is tough. And, you know, it's definitely not something that um, is always a cakewalk or always a lot of fun, right? There was a lot of times where people, you know, were unrealistic. And, you know, as the peon, you got yelled at all the time. And I remember going home many a night and, and crying and saying, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. And, you know, but I think so. So, yeah, I think over time you do develop it, right? Because you get used to, um, you, you kind of get used to kind of how things go, but you know, back to, to, to your question specifically, when you talk about undesirable clients, I, I just want to clarify that a lot of times clients aren't undesirable per se, right? Um, I don't think, you know, clients try and, and purposefully be difficult. I mean, you know, you do have some that, that really are. Um, but I think a lot of times there's, there's a little bit of, um, you know, ignorance involved, right? Because a lot of times uh, your organizations, you know, are, are, especially when you're dealing with a corporation, right? A lot of the expectations are still kind of set from the top down. And a lot of times those expectations are a little bit out of touch. And so I think that, you know, it's not necessarily about an undesirable client, but more of a client that, that might need a little bit more of an education about, you know, um, maybe why, why an issue is happening or how to reach their target audience or what is an, you know, uh, what is a reasonable output or a reasonable result from a, from a campaign, right? Because a lot of times it's not, you know, you can't expect for them, um, you can't expect for a client to, um, I don't want to say be reasonable, but you can't expect things if they're, if they're just, if they just don't know any better, right? So I think a lot of it is about education as well. No, and remember that you don't have to like everybody that you work for. And you don't have to tattoo their name on your arm. Yeah. So, you know, get the job done ethically, soundly, productively, and then just be happy you didn't marry that person. And so considering knowing, you know, like having um, that information or at least translating that information um, between you and your client what do you consider to be like your most um, helpful classes or courses that you took either in training or in college that helped you the most in working in the field you do now so i'm glad i don't have any of my former professors on the line um but i'm gonna say this right um I think all of the courses are extremely helpful. I think that, you know, uh, you know, all of the classes that I took as an undergrad um, eventually made some sense. Um, I will say that for me, the most, um, the most that I got out of my education was certainly at, at the graduate level, because I felt like um, when I was going for my master's degree in communication studies, there was a lot more hands-on stuff. There was a lot more um, things that were very applicable. I was able to kind of use some of my professional experience. But I think that as far as my undergraduate degree was concerned, I think the, the, the most value that I got was out of, you know, uh, my internship experience, right? Because what a lot of people don't know going into PR is that PR just looks so different you know, across various industries, you know, as, as a person who majored in it or, or was, uh, you know, progressing towards a degree in print journalism, I really had a passion for writing. And I really wanted to, to write the press releases. I really wanted to do the pitching. And I remember getting this internship in the fashion industry and I was working for Bismarck Phillips and they, you know, they had me working in a fashion closet. You know, they had me sending out samples. They had me, you know, running across town to bring things to a photo shoot. Um, it, you know, I, and I never really got to do a lot of the writing. And I remember, you know, going up to my account manager and saying, can I write a press release? I, I was basically like a nerd. I was like begging to write. And, um, you know, and, and I, what I learned was that 
that wasn't necessarily where I wanted to be because that's not the type of PR that I was interested, you know, in doing, right? So, you know, gravitating towards government and politics, I really got to do the writing. I got to do the research. I got to write speeches for people. And that really helped me utilize my theater experience because I got to put myself in the shoes of another person, right? Um, so I think that that to me was so valuable. You know, it definitely, um, you know, the educational experience that is the classes are so important, right? Learning the theory, learning all the things that you learn in those textbooks is extremely important. But I think second to that, the most that I, the most value that I got was certainly from those internships. I'm not a PR person, but I would think that um, to um, to have a to have broad knowledge of the world that you're going to be working in. Uh, first of all, you I think you every PR person should know something about. Uh, journalism, about social media, uh, and how all of these various um, uh, platforms work today. It's not just print journalism anymore. You have to meet the reader on all different levels and all different platforms. So you should know how to, how it works and how um, and and how to contribute to it. And then also some liberal arts, um, some liberal arts classes, you know, just about the world in general, have some knowledge about the world around you. Um, I don't think that can hurt. I mean, I know we all like to major in all the subjects of our major, um, but it also helps to have some broader knowledge to bring to the table as opposed to just your, whatever you're majoring in per se. So. I think the PR campaigns class is a pretty awesome experience. From what I hear from students, it really gives them an opportunity to work on a campaign. And I remember when I was an undergrad class, we didn't have the class called PR campaigns, but we, you know, we worked on a campaign and still to this day, like I remember how excited I was to put together the campaign. It was for the boardwalk bullies in Atlantic City. And, you know, in addition to having an internship, I just think getting that, um, that workshop experience working on a project will be helpful to a student. And internships, um, don't get phased if your internship makes you feel bad the first couple of weeks or months and you're just like, this isn't what I wanted to do, or you're on the train, like feeling broke. Um, all of those little crappy experiences you might have as an intern or at an entry level job, they, they do build, it does build. And if you can just be patient with the process, you'll see that it will be worth it down the road to like kind of start at the bottom, even though you don't always want to start there. I also just want to uh, jump in because I, I, I found that, um, you know, they say that in PR, we become kind of the jacks of all trades and the masters of none, right? And I think that it's so important um, to, to, to kind of learn as much as you can, especially in today's world about things like photography, you know, video production, right? Because the, the better you are at compiling, you know, that type of, um, you know, those types of assets for, you know, your client, for the media, right, the, the more effective that you're going to be. I mean, we all know in the industry that a lot of times we're working on some very, very tight budgets, right, especially if you're kind of in-house. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I took, as, as part of my undergrad, I took some photography courses, I took some, you know, video production classes, and I felt like those at least gave me a baseline to know what I was talking about in coming in and kind of, um, you know, working for some of my clients. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, don't um, shy away from taking some of those classes that'll really complement, you know, what you're already learning. Okay, so we have about three minutes left in the panel. We did want all of the panelists and all of the PRSSA students to stay on just to take like a quick group photo that we want to put on the website. But for the very last question of the panel, and all the answers have been really, really amazing. We appreciate it. Um, what's the most fulfilling part about working in PR, journalism, marketing, all that stuff? I'll just say from, from a journalism production, uh, looking at it through that lens, 
as well because and working with with PR entities the craft of storytelling is so being able to tell a story an effective story and having that skill knowing that a story that you wrote produced can have a have an impact on someone whether it's one person or a million people it is really something special and is, is sacred and taking responsibility to make sure that that information is accurate and you know as as best articulated as possible is it's it's a great responsibility but with it comes great reward as well well it's a public service you know you really feel that you are in a pub serving the public uh, uh, whether you're a journalist or a PR professional, uh, you feel like you're adding something positive to um, you know, the general community around us. When people are in trouble, um, when, when they've been stonewalled, stonewalled in every aspect of their life, the very, last, uh, the very last call they make is to a media outlet uh, to have somebody uh, come and help them. So we really do provide uh, a great public service or we should be providing a great public service. I feel like for me, you know, I'm not, I haven't really actively done a lot of PR in the past few years, but more recently, like my buddy made a film and it was, you know, cruising the independent film um, festival circuit and he really needed some coverage. So I wrote a press release and, you know, got the stuff together and started to just send it out, send it out. And this was, um, I guess, back in the spring before the pandemic. And I got a hit and I got like a story and it was like a front page of a real magazine and like the website. And even though it was just, you know, like a smaller art publication, I just was like, damn, you still got it, girl. And just that feeling of having somebody say yes and publish something that you've pitched. Um, even though I don't, you know, do a lot of PR now, it made me feel so good. And I think that's the coolest part about PR is knowing that you can be influential and get yes, get a yes and have your client, whether they're paying you or not paying you go to bed at night, feeling like they're getting movement because of the work you put in. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that, you know, um, the, the best part of what I do, especially now that I'm working in nonprofit and I work, um, you know, with the small business community, it, it, and it's been extremely rewarding right now during the pandemic, um, you know, knowing everything that small businesses are going through. You know, we recently held a campaign, uh, or, or actually, we're still in the process of doing a shop small campaign for our small businesses. And nothing was more rewarding than seeing uh, or getting feedback from our businesses that you know they're seeing an increase in foot traffic again, again that they're you know that they're they're doing business right. So to see that to to see that moment when the tide starts to shift is actually extremely rewarding. So I, I would echo that. You know, making a change. Um, I see people coming to our food pantry and walking away with boxes and Thanksgiving turkeys. And I see the money coming in the door for early childhood education and underserved districts. So while I felt like I was doing valiant work in some of my other positions, um, you know, again, being primarily focused on nonprofits right now, I can actually see that change happen. And sometimes in PR, you feel like it's so much outreach, but what happens as a result of that's something that I, I feel like is super rewarding. Like when you do see that change happen, like Professor Atkin said, when the press release gets picked up and you know, those things are, are easier to measure um, sometimes than others. And that was seeing that change happen is kind of really what motivates me. Okay, and on that note, I think that concludes our discussion. I don't know if I should do a round of applause. All the answers were really, really amazing today. We really appreciate it. Um, so this group photo, I don't know if I should turn it over to Professor Sullivan or Karen to do that because I have no idea how to take a photo through Zoom, but we really, really appreciate everybody <laughs> showing up today and participating. I can take care of it, don't worry. <laughs>